Through the journey of my wakeful years, I have witnessed and tried to grasp the meaning of this multitude known as human life. I saw countless ideologies, rules and rituals known as religions all playing out on the world stage, trying to control and govern the world as they see it. And yet they had no answer. The more I seeked, the more I learned that the answers lay in the simplistic understanding of the dharma of the earth, the sun, the moon and the cosmos. On one such journey, I had the fortune to meet Major Surendra Mathur from India, another seeker like me, who took me along with him into the eastern reaches of Europe, where I walked into the footsteps of ancient cultures on my quest to decode the root cause of this perceivable world. The cultural affinity of ancient Central Asia with the Indian subcontinent points towards the idea of a common origin of its people. Following the British colonial expansion into India, a language came into the attention of the Western scholars who were knowledgeable in ancient Greek and Latin. An Orientalist by the name of Sir William Jones was the first to state this fact. In a lecture in 1786 to the Asiatic Society, he said, The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is a wonderful structure, more perfect than Greek, more copious than Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either yet bearing to both of them a strong affinity in roots of verbs and in the forms of grammar than could possibly be produced by accident. William Jones' insight marks the beginning of scientific study of the language family that we now call Indo-European. Jintara Songaila, a Lithuanian politician and public figure and a follower of the ethnic Baltic religion Romova, is an expert on the subject of Baltic and Indo-Aryan cultures. Of course, uh, we can see these links uh, via language uh, links because there are similar words, similar uh, things uh, which uh, we can say about religion, uh, old religion. Uh, of course, um, the, there are two things. One thing, we were your northern neighbors and because of that, of course, there are very ancient uh, links and you can see that from ancient words which are very similar. Oh, another point is that uh, there is of course an uh, Indo-European horizon which is uh, not very clear yet from where all those uh, Indo-European languages and nations did occur but uh, uh, for sure they were somewhere from Eastern Europe and uh, because of these links they are also also not only uh, exceptional links between Baltic people and uh, Indo-Aryan people, but also with other Indo-European, older Indo-European nations and languages, Latin, Greek and others. In the last 200 years, owing to the extensive research on this subject, scholars have found the similarities not only between the words and their meanings, but also in the culture, custom, faith systems and the way of life. Though stringent efforts have been made to reconstruct a comprehensive theory, a strong identification of the Indo-European homeland has not yet happened. There are about 445 living Indo-European languages, including some of the major world languages like Spanish, English, Hindi, Urdu, Portuguese, Bengali, Punjabi, Russian, each with over 100 million speakers, with German, French, and Persian also having a very significant number. The present successor of the old Baltic Indo-European religion is the Romova community. Headed by High Priestess Inia Trinkunaini, Romova is a contemporary community that has revived the ethnic Baltic religion. It follows the ancient cultural practices of the Lithuanians before their Christianization in 1387. It was a matter of great honor for me to be able to attend the ceremony when Honorable Iniyatri Kunaini was made the High Priestess of the Romova religion. Inia has been a driving force 
in the life of her late husband, Jonas Trinkunas. She was always with him through his journey of creating Romova, reviving the ethnic Baltic faiths and starting a new chapter in the story of the ancient Indo-European culture. After his untimely demise in 2014, the leadership of the Romova community was passed to his wife. Romova uh, is a religious organization. So when we describe it, we, we are saying that old Baltic religion community. So, and when we want to say in one word, we say Romova. The start was in 19... 67. At that time, my husband, uh, Krivis uh, Jonas, Jaunus, uh, he was young, he was um, a lecturer at university, and uh, he and his friends were uh, interested in ethnology, in folk tradition, and of course in old religion. And uh, they <clears throat> Um, yet feeling that it should be not only be such as pure studies but also they had feeling that it should be alive. Jonas Rinkunas, the founder of Romova and one of the key persons responsible for the Lithuanian folk movement, struggled for long for the independence of his country and for the revival of the Baltic faiths. It was in 1992 after a long struggle with the Soviet Union and the subsequent independence of Lithuania that Romova was recognized as one of the Baltic faiths. What is now seen as the Lithuanian ethnic religion was once a part of the larger Indo-European cultural spread, which was present in the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, South Europe, Baltic and Levant. With practices based on scientific principles and cosmological knowledge, this culture was rooted in its fundamentals about perception of creation, time, astronomy, the zodiac and the science of the pantheon of twelve. One of the most important principles of the Indo-European culture and specifically the Baltic and the Indo-Aryan culture is the significance of Agni. Agni, a word which is heard throughout the world languages in different forms. Agoin in Russian, Ignis in Latin, Ugnes in Lithuanian and so on. At the crudest it means fire. And at the deepest, it means transition of energy. Agni is transition. Agni in Latin is ognis. Uh, and um, uh, we are we are a nation. We are nations of so-called ugnes garbento, uh, the worshippers of the fire. Uh, we were we worshippers of the fire up to the late uh, medieval time. Uh, we are last last. Uh, fire worshippers in, in uh, Europe. The old Baltic religion Romova is based around the concept of fire or Agni and many traditions and rituals are performed with fire at its center. Main thing at the center of our ceremony is it's a fire. It's lighting a fire and um, we have fire altars uh, they were used in some such kind of uh, public, uh, some public festivals. And uh, the essence is that, that uh, the fire is such kind of mediator between, uh, between um, uh, man, man's world and, and uh, the heaven. When the first mantra of the Ved begins with fire, it says, Agni Milet Rohitam. Now, it is not merely nature worship. It has a deep philosophical significance because 
the seer or the poet of the hymn is identifying himself with fire. So he says that I worship fire. It is one meaning of the line and another meaning of the line is I adore the priest who is himself a fire. That is identifying fire with the priest, with man. That is the basic thing. The earliest men, the primitive men, were identifying themselves with nature as such. And they were finding that in nature there is a circle. Circle in the sense that nature not only takes from us, it gives us also. And this give and take game in the nature was symbolized by sacrifice by Yajna. Rigveda goes at length to explain the concept of Agni. One such form of Agni is the living organism itself. One that conserves its entropy by the means of consuming and digesting food. We know that a living organism is an open system covered by permeable membranes which allows heat exchange to occur at various places within its components. The heat or the energy exchange is required not only for gross molecular movement but also for the logical and discerning thinking process happening inside the brain. There are three types of Agni, the solid, the liquid and the gaseous as explained in Rig Veda. This trinity of Agni is also referred to as the Agni Aap Vak in Indo-European languages. This transition of energy from one place to another facilitates propagation of life from one time to another. This play or Leela as sportingly called in the Vedas can also be called the Yajna of our solar system, an ongoing solar Yajna. Travelling south from the Baltic region, we arrived in the land west of the Black Sea. Hungary was the next country we visited in Europe. The name Hungary is derived from the name Hun, an ethnic group that claims to have arrived there from present-day Central Asia. The Huns were great warriors who travelled all over the world after the domestication of the horse in Central Asia. Alternatively, they are also called the Shakas, the Seke or the Sakai. The remnant of the Shaka name can be traced back to popular historical figures and characters such as the Shak Dvipi Brahmins of the Mahabharat, the Parath Rajas of Baloch region and the Seke warriors of Transylvania. I had the honor to meet Dr. Imre Kovac, a Seke himself and an expert on the Central Asian Seke culture. This long history starts somewhere in Central Asia uh, with the domestication of the horse. All the people all those nations who participated in the domestication of the horse became the engines of the ancient history. Why? Because uh, sitting on the horse, riding the horse, they were able to cover huge areas and they were able to uh, uh, go on campaigns to faraway lands. And they did. One of the primary concepts of the Indo-European civilization, which are common in all its forms, is the concept of time and its perception as being cyclic in nature. Like the mathematical fractals seen in all the patterns across the known universe, life in the Indo-European culture is seen as an evolutionary cyclic progression. Sahasra Yuga Paryantam Aharyat Brahmano Viduho Krishna in Bhagavad Gita states that in this perceivable world the eternal being Brahma who lives through us has a day of 1000 human years and a night of the same length. On the onset of his night the entire perceivable world envelops itself into a state of singularity and then it is born again once the day commences for the Brahma. 
you know, the difference between uh, all the Indo-European people and uh, so-called Western uh, Christian or, or culture or Christendom is that the concept of, of time, the concept of time, uh, you know, in, there is a in European and now very common understanding that time is linear and is going uh, uh, in historical time and uh, starting from Christ, of course. But uh, uh, our understanding is more cycle understanding, it's more renewing it every, every year, renewing, you renew everything, you renew your time, your, 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 your inner life, your outer life, your, your relations with your in your community. As mentioned across many ancient Indo-European texts, matter is perceived to be the very ingredient of time and vice versa. Spoken very poetically in the Nasadiya Sukta of Rigveda, the concept of matter and time is explained as follows. When the consciousness gets wrapped up into the sticky terrain of desires, the universal time tends to get converted into living matter which we perceive as life in the space-time episode. Very similar descriptions are also found in the Song of Volva in the very well-known Scandinavian folklore, the poetic Edda. This leads us to the next theory of existence according to the Indo-European culture, the cosmic tree. The cosmic tree or the world tree or the tree of life is a motif present in several cultures and mythologies, particularly in the Indo-European religions. It is known by many names in different cultures, Modun in Mongolian, Yagdrasil in Germanic, Oak in Slavic and Finnish, Ashwatha in the Hindus, and Ostraskox in Romova. Urdva Mula Madhashakam Ashwatham Prahuravyayam Chandam Sijasya Parnani Yastam Veda Savedavim In Chapter 15 of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna states that in an infinite space there exists a tree which is upside down with its foundations going upwards and the central column pushing forth downwards in forms of countless streams of time, mutating and changing, forming the unidirectional arrow of time. On the branches made up of the nervous system and the senses develop the leaves. The leaves and its attributes are what we call human life. At a curious karmic juxtaposition of space and time, this cosmic tree, which is weaved by an ever-desireful mind, gets transformed into a mesmerizing dawn of pure consciousness and sets itself free from any sort of bondage like birth and death and hence space and time. This has been explained in various religions all over the world as salvation, renunciation, mukti, moksha and nirvana. Dr. Imre took us to the city of Mirkuryachuk in Transylvania to attend the Baba festival. This festival is celebrated by the Seke Christian community for Virgin Mary, whom they believe they'll see in the rising sun. The biggest, probably the biggest, most important worship is Pünkösh. tell you about the history of this festival. Way before Christianity, the Shomyo mountain was a very, very sacred place. People used to go there before the summer equinox and they used to fast before they went there. They went there on foot from villages under banners, singing songs and uh, they kept fasting during all that time. And then, before the day of, of the 
culmination of this festival, they kept awake. They didn't sleep. They kept praying all night. Then in the morning, they went up to the ridge of the mountain before dawn, before sunrise. And they were waiting for the rising sun in the dark. And when the sun was rising, they all looked into the sun to see Baba in the sun, the goddess. And if that happened, then complete happiness, enlightenment, and wish for fulfillment was theirs. But Dr. Imre claims that Baba is originally a Sekhe Central Asian goddess who is represented as the sun. When we worship the sun, we don't worship the planet. In the sun, we recognize certain qualities. And this one quality of the sun is that it makes no differentiation. The sun shines on everybody. So whoever adopts the mind of the sun, whoever is enlightened, his body, his mind is like a sun, does not differentiate between people. He is equally kind and giving with everybody. The other uh, quality of the sun is light. The Hungarian word, and Seke speak Hungarian, so there were two, for the world is Vilag, and the word for light is Vilag. So for us, light and word are identical. So word is light, and light is word. In the Seke mythology, she is one of the seven forms of goddess described in their spiritual sciences. This is very similar to a certain description in the Rig Veda which tells about a chariot of seven wheels with seven horses on which are mounted the seven sisters who ride as a team through time. <laughs> This analogy refers to the seven lines on the planet Earth, from Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn, which the sun traverses twice every year, resulting in the seasons, the atmosphere and the very life. Interestingly, certain communities in India who claim to have a Central Asian or Eastern European ancestry, like the Chitpavans of Konkan, up till five centuries ago, used to worship the solar deity in its feminine form. The greatest minds of the world were invested in deciphering the mysterious spiritual tale, The Divine Comedy, by Dante Alighieri. The three canticas of The Divine Comedy have 33 cantos each. Now the question arises, why 33 cantos? What could have been the significance of the number 33 for Dante? Curiously, in most of the world religions, we find an omnipresent Godhead having three aspects. In the Indo-European Vedic religion, there are 33 groups of divinity divided into three. Like in the human body, the spinal cord has 33 vertebrae protecting the three nadis, namely Ida, Pingala and Sushumna, popularly known as the Kundalini. Just like Dante's description of his encounter with Virgin Mary in the Paradiso Cantica, when the third Nadi, that is Sushumna, gets illuminated, the divine experiences of paradise can be observed. So we see that in every religion, to reach realization, one needs to find grace from the feminine deity, may it be Virgin Mary, Saraswati, Shakti, or the Goddess Baba of the Seke culture. So, uh, the ultimate status of the word is light, movement, and consciousness. The word is something which is made out of light, which, which moves and which knows about itself. As is with the vibrant Romuva in the now dormant Seke culture, the Vedic civilization also needs to look deeper at its roots. In this Indian subcontinent, in the pages of its ancient history, there must still be a Dhyo, the lord of space-time, and there must still be an Indra, the king of the pantheon of twelve. Under a layer of superstition, rituals, customs and religion, there must still be a shining Aditi and the twelve Adityas waiting to be acknowledged. You know, life is a big mystery and if you want to understand 
a little bit about mysterious life and mystery itself, then you should look to the relation, Baltic and Indo-Aryan relation. Then you starting to feel what it is mystery. Due to the unrelenting quest and tenacious capacity of Major Surendra Mathur, I was introduced to the charming Lithuanians and the Valorous Seikes, both carrying questions like me that maybe the Indian civilization can answer. There is still a lot to be done and a lot to be told, and though there is no beginnings or endings on this wheel of time, this is still a new beginning.